You're listening to Media Savvy Moms with Melody and Marilyn, a podcast by Parents Aware, your go to for information on how to talk to kids and teens about pornography and healthy sexuality. everyone and welcome back to the Media Savvy Moms podcast. Today we will be talking with our guest Holly Ann Martin and we will be connecting body safety. That's a that's a topic we've discussed in the past, but we're going to connect it with the issue of early exposure to pornography and really empowering kids to feel safe and be safe wherever they are. Now, Holly Ann is uh, the Managing Director of Safe for Kids. This is a Western Australia company specializing in abuse prevention education training. They have extensive resources, like, oh my goodness, so many resources that are designed to help parents and teachers have difficult conversations with their children. There's read aloud books, parent guides, teacher training, songs, and more. And they believe in empowering the learner, your kids, with tangible takeaways and skills that help them build respectful relationships throughout their life. So I will leave the rest up to Melody and Holly Ann. Go ahead. Thank you, Marilyn. Welcome to the show, Holly Ann. Oh, I'm so excited to be with you. (laughs) We're so excited to have you. We love Holly Ann. We met at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation Global Summit. And she was in the corner with all the Aussies and she just is my favorite. So, um, and we are so passionate about the same things and protecting our kids and keeping them safe and abuse prevention. And so we're just kind of kindred spirits, aren't we, Holly Ann? Certainly are. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your neck of the woods, where you live um, and some of the work that you do with Safe for Kids. So I live in Perth, Western Australia um, with my husband. Um, we, um, he came home one day and I was in tears. I had my own, I had the company to begin with, um, and something really bad had happened. So he said, that's it. You can't do this by yourself anymore. So you might remember have met Roger at the conference as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So I get to do all the face-to-face stuff. And when I say face-to-face, I get to stand in front of on average about four and a half thousand children every year. I train a hundred, sorry, a thousand teachers and a thousand parents every year, but he gets to do all the boring, you know, tax stuff and invoicing and stuff like that. (laughs) Good team, go team. So who came home in tears? He did or you did? No, I was in tears. He came home from work one day. He used to work for a a, a national football team. Mm -hmm. Um, So he had a very prestigious job, but he was seeing how hard I was working and, you know, he takes these footballers to out for coffee and they say, Oh, you don't have to pay. And here I am working really hard and not getting any money. And he just, he just wanted to pay back as well, to be honest, and and to make a difference. So he quit his job with a very prestigious football team and um, has never been happier. So I'm still the boss, but um, when he lets me, (laughs) But yeah, we're just really fortunate to be in a position where, um, you know, we both don't have children. So we've both dedicated our lives to keeping other people's children safe. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful story. I'm so glad that we have you guys and so glad you're such a great team. So why did you start in the beginning? What's, what's your story, Holly Ann? What, why are you so passionate about this and what brought you into child protection in the beginning? Well, I started my, te- my career as a, a teacher assistant in a school with children with special needs. And the year before I started at the school, there was a critical incident at the school where uh, a foster parent who was volunteering on the bus with kids with special needs was abusing the children. Mm-hmm. And so we were the first school, one of the first schools in Western Australia trained in protective behaviours. Um, and teachers never felt comfortable saying the names the correct anatomical names for body parts. So they'd say, Oh, Holly, you go and do it. You go and do it. You do it better than me. And so I always jumped at the chance because I I loved it. Mm -hmm. Um, And the training just made sense because so it's based on a program called protective behaviors, but I've stopped calling it protective behaviors because people think of Taekwondo or something. Mm -hmm. I call it protective education because it came to Australia in the late eighties in the place of stranger danger. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Now we know only about 4% of child sexual abuse is by a stranger. 96% is by somebody that's known and possibly loved by the child. So it just made sense to me. But what happened was for 25 years, I taught it to the children that I was working with. And then in 2007, I went up into two remote Aboriginal communities here in Western Australia, where some terrible, terrible abuse was going on. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I went in something called my long service leave. I don't know if you have long service leave in the US and, and Canada, but basically once you work for 10 years, you get six, uh, three months paid holiday. So I'm on my three months paid holiday. And, you know, I could have gone to France, but no, I go up into a remote Aboriginal community. Um, <laughs> And I just saw a huge need for resources and teaching programs and things. So I quit my job and took a quarter of a million dollar loan out of my home to produce all this stuff. Wow. And I've been doing it full time ever since. Oh, wow. You are amazing. That's a beautiful, that I just, wow. So, so if you guys didn't pick up on that, there was, there was some really amazing information in there. We had talked about how stranger danger is a misnomer and don't tell your kids stranger danger. I, I don't know if you missed that quit statistic that Holly Ann dropped for us, but only about 4%, you said, of abuse happens from kids, um, people kids don't know. 96% of abuse happens from people that our children do know. Um, so we don't tell your kids, be careful of strangers. We need to te teach our children to be safe of everybody and make sure that they know that they don't have to let anyone touch them, even whether they know them or not. So that's something that's really important and something that you emphasize in your materials, right, Holly Ann, um, that we need to be teaching our children for sure. Definitely. Um, and a statistic, I'll, I'll talk slower because I know us Australians talk way too fast. No, you're good. Um, a statistic that nobody is talking about, about 45% of sexual abuse is either children on other children or teenagers on children. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that here in Australia is um, when, people, when the police are investigating, it links back to kids having seen pornography. Mm -hmm. And so because children don't know how to express it, they're actually acting it out. So. Um, you know, it's whether it's in within your family, you know, it might be your cousin and things like that. So, you know, people tend to think of perpetrators as a man in a trench coat behind, hid behind a bus stop and mm. it couldn't be further from the truth. So we're not about frightening children with our program. It's, a, it's about empowering them. And to be honest, I, I talk about it as if it's just a life skills program rather than a sexual abuse prevention program because it's about empowering children and giving them a language. So it's a suicide prevention program. It's a drug prevention program. It's a bullying prevention program. Mm -hmm. But the spin-off is, yes, it is a, a sexual abuse prevention program. Sure, absolutely. I, yeah, we, we were talking about that the other day, how, um, you know, we teach our children our ABCs. We teach them to count. We, we live in a digital world now where... Pornography is so prevalent that this is a life skill. We need to teach them to protect themselves because it's just like teaching ABCs and one, two, threes, right? And you were talking about how in Australia, these statistics are valid that um, this is happening, these, this child-on-child -child sexual behavior um, because of pornography that is not unique to Australia that is happening here in U.S. and Canada too, unfortunately. And actually, um, Kristen Jensen, who wrote Good Pictures, Bad Pictures, um, who we all know and love, she wrote um, that book in the wake of actually a parent approaching her um, in tears because of a child abusing his younger sibling in the wake of pornography. So that's a perfect example of another um, caring adult acting in uh, the wake of pornography and abuse and the connection between the two and coming out and saying, whoa, we got to educate our children. We got to give them this life skill um, and in this connection between pornography and abuse, right? Definitely. So, yeah. All over the I world. believe that we need to start protective education when children are three at the latest. And I believe that we need to start talking about pornography from six at the latest. 
And of course, when I say that here in Australia, we think we're very progressive. But when I say that to parents, they freak out. But, you know, there is so much of it on YouTube and every child's on YouTube. So you, mm-hmm. you cannot put your head in the sand. But the other problem is when people, when I say about, you know, talking to kids about pornography, people go back to their childhood and think about, you know, it might have been a Playboy magazine under the big brother's bed or in dad's cupboard. Parents don't realise the gravity of the violence and all of the terrible things that kids are being exposed to. So, you know, we need to start, and and I don't call it pornography with um, children. I call them private pictures and private movies mm-hmm. um, because that's not a judgment. It, and it's all part of the public and private lesson where we're naming body parts and rooms in your homes and stuff like that. So it, it doesn't have to be frightening. Um, but when I'm brainstorming to, with children, where might you see pictures or movies of people with no clothes on? Five-year-olds can tell me on iPhones, on iPads, YouTube always comes up. I, w- I had a boy once put up his hand and say, on an aeroplane, miss. And I've gone, oh, oh, okay, maybe, yeah, I guess. The very next week, I was sitting on a plane next to a guy watching Game of Thrones and thought, that's what that child was talking about. He's obviously sat next to somebody watching something inappropriate on a plane. And I hadn't even considered that. So... You know, and the latest thing he, kids in Australia are now saying is at the grandparents' house oh. because parents have filtering. You know, they might have, you know, some sort of filtering device that would stop it at home, but poor old granny doesn't think to have it on their, their computers. So kids take over their iPads or whatever and they're watching it at the grandparents' house. Interesting. Right. And so they're on their Wi-Fi at grandma and grandpa's house and they may not have circle or they may not have something protecting their router or right it's just like being on public wi-fi wow so you're having these experiences where you're going in and you're talking to these children children that are telling you where they're seeing these private pictures so we're not because i as adults we're trying to anticipate right where they're going to run into these things and imagine but having you come in and talk to these kids and they're telling you five-year-olds where they're seeing private pictures and not in a um, scared or judgmental or um, you're, cause you're not coming in and accusing them. You're just brainstorming with them. So what do you think? You know, that's, it's, oh, it's a, it's a great thing to be able to educate kids at a young age like this so that they aren't, aren't feeling cornered or, uh, or accused, but educated and, and then they know. I was at a school and a, a five-year-old little girl put up a hand and when I said, where might you see private pictures or private movies? She put up a hand and said, Snapchat, miss. And I've gone, sweetie, you're five. How do you know about Snapchat? Oh, oh because my 14-year-old sister's using it? Obviously for sending naked pictures because how would a five-year-old know that that's where you would see it? So, mm. you know, kids are also learning off their siblings, but... For me, YouTube is the biggest problem. I was in a school where I had 32 seven-year-olds and I'm doing the public and private lesson, which is where I cover this particular subject. And we were brainstorming, where could you see it all? And the kids, kids never say calendars or magazines because that's so last century, Mm -hmm. but they know all the tech places that you can see. And I don't put the words in their mouth. They tell me. Anyway, the lesson finishes. I'm standing in the doorway letting the children go out for play. Eight of the 32 children stayed behind. I said, come on, off you go. I want a cup of tea. Get. And they said, no, miss, we need to see you. And each child came up to me one at a time privately telling me how they had all, every one of them had seen pornography on YouTube. But not one child had told a parent for fear of getting into trouble or having the parent take the device away from them. Mm. And here for this first time was this nice lady talking so openly. And because it's done in such a way that it's not judgmental, I'm not, you know, growling at them or anything like that. It is like a release for them because they, they don't know how to process it. So, you know, when, when you can just talk openly about it um, and, you know, um, it, it, the other, other way that I, I would refer to them, so we use private pictures or private movies, 
um, would be safe pictures or unsafe pictures. Um, again, because there's no judgment there. So it it's, can be done sensitively without um, putting ideas in children's heads. Sure. So how do you cross that barrier or you're going in to teach about body safety, but you get into the conversation about private pictures? So one of the things that um, is the basis of our program, so we've got a, a 10 week program with 10 concepts and concept five is teaching kids about public and private. Mm. So I start the lesson off where we talk about there are three private rooms in your home. So bedrooms, bathrooms and toilets are private rooms. And what makes them private is when you shut the door. Then we go on to things that we do with our body that's private. So burping and passing wind and swearing and all of those other things. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, I talk about private pictures and private movies. And that's where we brainstorm where might you see them. And so one of the things um, I do is I, I pull out a book and I hold the book up and I say, I'm going to pretend this is an iPad and I'm going to type in fairies, but a picture of a lady with no clothes on and big fairy wings comes up. Mm. What should I do? And the children go, one boy put up his hand and said, well, miss, I would type in fairies with clothes on, <laughs> which is hilarious. I said, well, mate, it doesn't work like that, actually. <laughs> But what I teach children to do is if you see private pictures or private movies, now I used to say, I want you to turn it over and then I want you to go and tell an adult. But now, because I had a, um, a, a somebody tagged me into some child exploitation material on Instagram about four months ago. And at the time it was horrendous, but now I look at it as a gift because what happened was Somebody has found something on Instagram that was heinous, um, involved child exploitation. And, but what they did was they didn't know how to, what to do with it. So they, what they've done is they put at Safe for Kids, at FBI, at Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. Mm. So I just get who is supposed to be, you know, that's where it's supposed to go. But I just get this message. So I open it up. I just burst into tears with what I was seeing. Mm -hmm. um, but I still had enough wherewithal to, to know what to do. So what I did was I took a screenshot of the man's face, but not what he was doing, a screenshot of his, his Instagram account, and then I go out to take a screenshot of um, the person that tagged me in. That had disappeared. So then I get online and I report it to our Australian Federal Police. Um, and I wrote it all down, you know, everything that I saw, um, the Instagram account and all that, and then I've got photos um, and all through my tears. Then I go up into our house because my office is in my garden, bottom of my garden. So I go up into the house and I say to my husband exactly what I saw. And I think I'm quite articulate, but he's just gone, oh, yeah, like big deal. Mm. Meanwhile, I'm almost hysterical. Oh. You know, and through my sobbing, he goes, oh, yeah? And it was like a light bulb moment because if I can't articulate what I saw, right? how is a child? And so oh, yes. I am still, that happened four months ago, and I am still having flashbacks. Every, about once a month, it'll pop into my mind and I just burst into tears. And children are explaining to me, they're describing they say, oh, but miss, you know, that, that picture pops into your mind and I can't sleep and all of this stuff. So they don't know that they're called flashbacks, but, but they definitely, that's what they're, they're feeling. Um, and it is affecting, you know, children's sleep. I was talking to a, a counsellor last week and she was telling me how she was counselling a young um, five year, uh, sorry, young 10 year old child who wouldn't go to sleep and she'd had five sessions with this young girl just talking about you know breathing exercises and all of these you know mumbo jumbo things about sleep and I happened to be talking to her about something else and she told me about this child and I said ask her if she's seen naked photos mm -hmm. she rings me back the next day and said Holly how did I not know that 
I'm a counsellor. Why did I not know that that child had seen pornography and was too scared to close her eyes to go to sleep because of, of the, the flashbacks and things like that? So this is why we have to have these conversations so young because children tell me, as you know, 88% of pornography is violence against women mm. and children worry that that's what dad's doing to their mums. Wow. And it, it's... You know, we have to have these conversations. But people, I don't think they have to be um, uncomfortable. If you if you incorporate it as part of the whole protective education program, kids just, you know, are comfortable with it. So when I'm working with young people, kids as young as six, I do a bit of brain science with them. And I explain that, you know, I put my fingertips together and explain, you know, about the size of a child's brain. I say, your brains are still growing, just like your bodies are still growing. And you know how you have to put healthy food into your body to grow up big and strong? You need to put healthy pictures into your mind to grow up big and strong. And then I touch my fingertips together and say, in your brain, you've got millions and millions of connections. But if you see private pictures or private movies, it changes the connections in your brain. It can rewire your brain. Right. And I also explain to them about um, it releases a chemical in your brain called dopamine. Kids love this. They eat it up. They love to learn about their body. They right. do. And I say, if you're eating chocolate, a little bit of dopamine, say, keep eating chocolate. Or if you run around, a little bit of dopamine, say, keep running around. I like that feeling. But if you see pictures or movies of people with no clothes on, it's like a flood of this dopamine in your brain. And it's not healthy for your brain. Your brain loves it, but it's not healthy. And so I teach kids to say, that's private out loud and turn away. And it's like turning off the dopamine tap. And it just makes sense to them. Beautiful, beautifully done. So we're going to come back in the second half and talk a little bit more about um, all of these hands-on ways that you teach kids um, to connect their feelings to their body. Um, and so we're going to take a little break and we'll be right back with Holly Ann. People are always asking us, what is the best way to start the sex talk with my kids? And I love to recommend the book, 30 Days of Sex Talks by Educate and Empower Kids. This is such a great book for so many reasons, one of which is that it's divided into three age-appropriate volumes. One is ages three to seven, one ages eight to 11, and one for ages 12 and up. Because let's face it, you are not gonna have the same sex talks with your three-year-old as you are with your 16-year-old. 30 Days of Sex Talks contains the most meaningful discussions you're going to have with your child made easy. Inside the book is a code that will allow you to download topic cards that you can print out and place in strategic locations like a mirror, the refrigerator, or in your pocket to remind you and your child to start talking. They've made it easy to engage your child in conversations about relationships, affection, anatomy, boundaries, predators, online dangers, and many other vital topics. Look for the 30 Days of Sex Talks on Amazon or visit the Educate and Empower Kids website at educateempowerkids.org. And we're back with Holly Ann Martin from Safe for Kids. And she goes into schools and before thousands of kids every year teaching about body safety and the connection with um, pornography, which is so fabulous. And we really love to get that going in our schools around here but we're working on it. Um, so we talked in the first half about uh, these connections she's making and talking to kids and having open conversations, which is so fabulous. And a lot of the statistics of child on child sexual behavior. And in the second half, we're gonna talk about some of the practical tools that Safer Kids has for us as parents to use with our children to help um, teach our kids and solve these problems. So Holly Ann, you have some great materials, lots and lots of materials. One of my favorites is the Parents Guide to Child Protection Education. And um, that's kind of like your end all um, index. It's got a little bit of everything in it, right? Um, yeah, that's and, basically the whole program in that, just that one book. Right. I remember the first time I saw you and I saw your booth at the end of the summit, you had this huge life-size silhouette 
um, of a child and it's the whiteboard, right? Yeah. Um, and so tell us a little bit about that there. So inside the child protection education guide, there is a, um, a sheet of paper. There's a girl or a boy and you can copy it off and use this same tool for your children. But tell us about this tool because I love it. And it's one of the things that makes your um, system so unique. So we teach children. So let me just back step a little bit. We talk about safe and unsafe. So I teach the children, I use the thumb up for safe and the thumb down for unsafe. And so when children need to know about what it's like to feel unsafe, and we talk about something called our early warning signs. Our early warning signs is that the body signals that we get when we feel unsafe. So it's our fight, flight, freeze, faint response. And all animals get early warning signs and there's lots of different activities we can do. But those, the sheets that you were talking about were, um, I would lay that on the ground and we brainstorm butterflies in their tummy, their heart racing, their legs feel like jelly, their hands might sweat. It's all of those physical sensations. We also look at how other animals show their early warning signs. You know, children know that snails and turtles go into their shell and that squid squirt ink and fortunately we don't have these in Australia <laughs> but kids in Australia know that skunks squirt out stinky farty smelly stuff <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's such a great tool because we talk to kids that you'll know yourself have you ever been standing in a crowd of people and somebody stood next to you and you go oh yuck mm -hmm. something about them creeps me out right and so as adults, we would call it intuition or gut feeling, but children really understand it when we call them early warning signs. And once children, we've done lots of activities to get them to feel them, like bursting balloons and all of these different things, mm. then every lesson from now on will refer back to these early warning signs. Do you feel safe or do you feel unsafe? Mm -hmm. But what I um, love about it is that you have them draw their early warning signs. And so like we, we, you have them feel and think about what do butterflies in th the tummy feel like? And then they draw their butterflies in their tummy or they feel what their jelly legs feel like. And then they draw the jelly legs on the knees or the, um, the rosy cheeks when we, when we blush and we feel, um, what are some of the other ones I have them in here in front of me, beads of sweat on our, on our palms, um, or in other parts of our body, wide eyes, um, hair on our arms stand up. And I love, um, part of the reason I love the, your, your system is because there are these hands-on things to do. Like you're talking about thumbs up and thumbs down. We get our body involved when we're learning. I think um, a lot of the times, at least for me um, in US, we have our children sit quietly and learn and read and write um, about when we're, when we're trying to teach them about things like body safety. But I love your methods because you have them do something, stand up, put your thumbs up and thumbs down, draw. I mean, you tell me how you feel and then feel it in your body. I love popping balloons and those sorts of things really make them learn on a different level where they'll remember and it will help them to, to um, get all their senses involved. So, and you were telling me why you do that. Why do you get the, all their senses involved? Well, because they're different learners. So you've got kids that listen. Um, some kids, kinesthetic learners, they mm -hmm. have to be doing stuff. Um, and also we have a song about early warning signs that I've written with Aboriginal children in a remote community. So, you know, again, the, um, I hope you share those links in the, the show notes yes. because they're all free on YouTube. But, you know, when you see the children dancing and, you know, and your legs feel like jelly and they're all wobbling everywhere, it's just, it has to be a whole, you know, we can't just be preaching at children. It just makes it, um, yeah, more realistic. But also one of the other things I do is I teach the children the sign language for public and for private um, and the two themes. But I, then I encourage them to go home and teach this to their families mm. because you'll know yourself. You've got both got children. Mm -hmm. Here in Australia, if kids go home from school, their parents will say, what did you do at school today? 
and children say, oh, nothing. Uh-huh. It's either nothing or stuff. But I find when they're learning this, they're going home, they're teaching the families the songs, they're teaching the families the sign language. All of that could be a protective factor mm-hmm. because, as you know, people that prey on children look for, you know, they know the children to target. And if kids are using this language, if they're teaching everybody, that could be a protective factor. So, you know, basically what I do now is 35 years worth of failures, to be honest. (laughs) Um, And I keep refining and adjusting and children, because I get to stand in front of so many children, um, kids will say things to me and I go, oh gosh, I need to make a resource about that. And so that's where my product development comes from, is listening to children. Um, You know, when protective behaviours came to Australia, there was no internet around. So we didn't have to talk. It's only really been in the last probably seven years, to be honest, that I've had to, um, you know, really talk to children about pornography because I've been doing it for 35 years. Mm -hmm. When I started, I never had to talk about that. But now every kid's got it in their back pocket because every kid's got an iPhone. Right. And so you so, add it in. Yeah. Update, update, tweak, tweak, right? And so you've got this system that it's always growing, always um, advancing with what we need to do. The other thing, the other practical um, tool that you've got is your three safety questions. Can you talk, can you talk to us about that? So I came up with those because I want children to always let an adult know where they're going. Mm -hmm. So before a child goes off and does anything, either in the real world or online, Mm -hmm. I want them to ask three three questions. Do I get a yes or no feeling? Does an adult I live with know where I am? And can I get help if I need it? And so in, in the real world, the example that I use with children is, if you go on a play date, mum knows you're at the play date. But what happens if the neighbour puts their head over the fence and says, hey, we're going to the beach or we're going to the swimming pool. Would you like to come? You've got to stop and ask the three safety questions. Well, yes, I get a yes feeling. It's a hot day. I want to go for a swim. Hold on. Does an adult I live with know where I am? No, but I could ring mum and see if it's okay if I go to the pool or the beach. Because what happens if there's an emergency? Mum thinks I'm at the house. She doesn't know I've gone to the beach. And then for online... The same thing, because especially, you know, when children are gaming and um, especially if they're using Discord where they've got the headphones on and people could be talking to them, Mm -hmm. do they know, well, yes, I get a yes feeling, I want to play, you know, these computer games. Does an adult I, you know, live with know what I'm doing online and do I know how to report abuse if somebody was using inappropriate language or or sending private pictures? So it's... It is a simple tool, but there are so many um, elements of of how you can use it. So, um, you know, all of these tools are just so valuable. And and one of the other strategies that we teach children is to have a safety team of five grown-ups that they can talk to. And the reason that we have five adults on the safety team is because sometimes um, they did a study here in, in Western Australia of children who had disclosed that they were being sexually abused. And evidence shows that children have to tell at least three people before they're listened to. Kids don't normally just come out and say what's happened. They might simply say to a family member, oh, I don't want to go to that person's house or, oh, I don't like that, you know, that Mm -hmm. um, scout leader or whatever. And parents say, come on, get in the car. We're running late. And that could have been a attempt disclosure. Right. So we use the hand. And we talk to them about you have to have five grown-ups and they have to be grown-ups because kids can't stop bad things happening to other kids. Mm -hmm. So how I encourage adults to do this with their children is to to brainstorm all of the different people in children's lives because we don't want them all from one environment. So to try and spread it, you know, from different parts of the community as possible. So on the thumb would be anybody from the children's home. So if they want mum and dad and grandma, if she lives with them, or their 22-year-old sister, they would just take up the thumb. On the next two fingers would be either two people from school or two people from childcare. And the reason for two people is if some children only had one person from school and the teacher was having the day off because they were sick or something, 
some kids don't have the cognitive skills to go, well, I could talk to the assistant or the principal. They just go, oh, goodness, I don't have a safety team today. Mm -hmm. And then on the last two fingers are two people from the community. So uncles and aunts, grandparents, people from church, next door neighbours, their friends' parents or friends of their parents, sports coaches, any after-school activity. And so with the two on the last two fingers, if they wanted to have their grandmother and grandfather and they live in the same house, they would just take up one finger. Mm -hmm. Because if you have one on one finger, one on the other finger, and they go on holiday, it's cut right down. If children's parents have split up, them and they were living with mum, their mum might go on the thumb and then dad or dad's new partner might go on one of the other two community fingers. Mm. If children were being fostered, then the foster family would go on the thumb and then their caseworker or their biological parent if they saw them. So what we're trying to do, like I say, is give kids a wider spread of people from different parts of the community. And then on the palm of their hands is where their friends, pets, um, God, you know, some a lot of kids want to put God on their safety team. And I said, well, he's going to go on the palm of your hand because, mm-hmm. um, you know, you, you can practice the words with him, but he can't stop the bad thing from happening. You need to, you know, go and tell an adult as well or toys or siblings and things like that. Beautiful. And then the on the support, wrist. Right. Sorry. The moral support is in the Yeah, palm. yeah. Yeah. And then on the wrist is for emergencies. So here in Australia, we have something called the Kids Helpline, which is a free phone number that kids can have ongoing counselling and things like that. But also teaching them, you know, to, to ring um, 911 and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's quite complex, um, but it's really important. And then we talk about if the first person doesn't listen, mm-hmm. you tell the next person and you keep telling until those early warning signs, those body signals go away. So it just makes sense to children, all of these things all linked together. Wonderful. So this is exactly what we're looking for. We promised some practical tools in the second half, and there they are. Thank you, Holly Ann. So Marilyn, would you like to do a little recap with us? I would love to. Thank you so much. Um, Now, I'm just going to go back to the beginning. We talked about stats and the misnomer of stranger danger. We can't can't ignore that, that 96% of people who abuse children are known and loved by that child. And a stat that we talk uh, less frequently about, but we need to start talking more about, is that 40% of those um, are children abusing other children or teens on child. And that is a direct tie we're finding right back to early exposure to pornography. So it's all related. And Holly Ann suggests that we start our protective conversations with our kids early. She has kids at as young as five tell her that they've seen private pictures, pictures of naked people on YouTube or on airplanes or at grandma's house. So we really need to start these protective conversations. She says age three for protective conversations and age six is when you would know later than age six to start the talk about pornography. And a child, this was one thing that really stood out to me is that a child can't necessarily articulate what they see. Even Holly Ann had trouble articulating something that she was exposed to, to her husband. It just couldn't get the message across. So we have to be proactive and ask questions and have these conversations early. And we can do it in a very comfortable way. So on to practical tips, teach early warning signs. I'm not gonna go over that again. Uh, We just did that. And we have three safety questions to go over. The yes, no feeling, does an adult I live with know what I'm doing and can I get help if I need it? And finally, she did such a beautiful job of explaining the team of grown-up safety people that our kids need to have. Perfect. Thank you, Marilyn. And thank you so much for joining us. Holly Ann, we always like to leave our listeners with a quick challenge that they can do with their kids, with their family. What is your challenge today? 
So I'd like to set families the challenge of making a safety team with each of their children, just to get a blank piece of white paper to trace around their hand and then help them brainstorm with them. If the worst thing ever was happening, who could you go to? Because quite often parents say to me, if anything happened to my child, they would tell me. And I'm telling your listeners now that they won't. Mm. Because those dear little people that you tuck into bed every night think they have to parent you. Mm -hmm. Because of the grooming process, they might have been threatened. They might have been, you know, I'll hurt your family if you tell anyone. They are more likely to tell a teacher or, or, or you know, somebody else. So to, to sit down and, and brainstorm with the children, who could you talk to? So on the thumb, people from their home, then two people from school, and then two people from the community. So that's the challenge that I set them. Perfect. Thanks so much for joining us today, Holly Ann. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Media Savvy Moms podcast. For detailed show notes and links to any of the resources mentioned today, visit parentsaware.info. To connect with us on social media, find us on Instagram at Media Savvy Moms and on Facebook and Twitter at Parents Aware. We would love to get your feedback. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to this podcast. Until next week, let's keep talking.